Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for coming this evening. Uh, my name's Ebony Bennett. I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and it's so wonderful to see you all here this evening. Um, before we begin, I'd like to introduce to you Uncle Michael West from the Metropoli Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Council, uh, who has our utmost respect and gratitude for coming along to give the welcome to country this evening. Uncle Michael's a member of the Stolen Generation. He's born and raised and lived his whole life in Sydney. And he's been the director of the New South Wales Indigenous Chamber of Commerce, co-chair of the National Sorry Day Committee and a delegate to National Congress of Australia's First People. Please welcome Uncle Michael West. I'd like to say Bojadi Gamaroa Gadigal Eora and good day and welcome to everyone to Gadigal and Eora country. And it's great um, having Yanis here, I think. Uh, I, was just having a, I was just having a yarn with him, just saying, look, I, I, ta I recorded Q&A uh, last night and I'll get a chance to watch it later um, and see what he says on there. But look, um, the world we live in is very complex, isn't it? Uh, technology's all around us, um, as we've seen when we had the um, Optus outage, um, how it affected people's lives, how we're all connected in the scheme of things. Um, and we're all connected in the scheme of things when you think about it, not technology, um, just by who we are, biology and, and living in this wonderful system, solar system, cosmos, whatever you call it, because we're all connected. Um, from the particles of dust to the solar winds, the drop of rains, everything's connected. Um, here where we are, obviously, is a, a, the most beautiful harbour in the world, as we say, um, down there. Uh, does anybody know what a traditional bark canoe's called here? Nawi, Nawi. Imagine being down there, Nawi, paddling out um, from this side, from Gadigal. You're looking at the other side of the coat hanger, and that's the bridge uh, to, uh, to us. And you're looking at the other side. What's the clan over there? Camaragal. Yes, it's great. People, a lot of people said that. And we're paddling past. We look at the Opera House. What's the traditional name where the Opera House land is? Warren, yes, Jabagali, Jabagali, say. And what was traditionally there? A midden, a midden. Guys, you guys know what middens are? Shells, collection of shells. It's about coming together, having something to eat, but it's also about understanding um, sustainability too and keeping count of what you're using our resources. And um, as we're turning left, we're, we're um, going uh, left, we're going west. We're paddling along, we see Barani come in with their little calf. They want to come in for a rest, but that's what, traditionally what would happen. What are Barani? Whales, yes. And they're going to Darling Harbour, which is traditionally called Gomorrah. Gomorrah, if you look at the door there um, in the ICC, you will actually see it because we are working with the ICC um, about educating people and that. So they would go in there for a rest as we keep paddling along. Um, we go to see the next clan we're waving at. What's past Gadigal? It starts with W. Wongle. Wongle. That's on the left. Some, I heard someone say Walla Madigal. That's on the right. And that's where Benelong is resting. That's Ride. Ben along with others are resting there. Ben along being a partner of a strong Camaragal woman, and we've gone past some um, headland, a little bit of headland there, little park named after her. Who's that? Barangaroo. And as we keep going, we eventually see um, a city, and we we see traditionally you'd see a clan down there, and the city's sort of named after the clan, but it's close, but it's not exactly what it is. What is it? Ba. Barra Marigal, Barra Marigal. In our language, double R's are like trills. So Barra, Barra means eel, obviously, and the eel there is part of the totems. Barani is a totem with Gadigal and other water clans, um, clans near the water, up and down the coast. And um, so those eels migrate to the South Pacific. And um, what I was going to say, there's a whole creation story about Sydney Harbour being created by a giant Barra, and that Barra is now just resting off of Balmain. What island's there? It's got four legs. Goat Island is what white fellas call it, but its traditional name is Memel, M-E-M-E-L, Eye of the Barra or Eye of the Eel. That's just some of the stories 
um, Sydney and across Australia that we, we need to learn. I know they haven't been taught in school, but um, they are starting to be taught in school uh, from the younger people coming through. And, um, you know, totems are very important to us. In New South Wales, we have uh, uh, Dinner Wine, which is Emu, in central New South Wales. And I'm not sure, Yanis, do you know that we have the oldest known human construction in the world today? No, they're the fish traps of Bawarana. They're more than 40,000 years old. Yes, more than 40,000 years old. Um, we also have burial sites um, with ceremony with ochre, and they're also 40 plus thousand years old. Um, we've been here for more than 65,000 years. And what I was going to say, another bird that I think is marginalised, another totem, it's from the Northern Territory, is the sacred ibis. Yes, the sacred ibis. <laughs> I'm, well, everyone gets a reaction to the sacred ibis. Look, the sacred ibis, Egyptians worship the sacred ibis. We have three different um, species of them here, like um, variants, you might say, of the sacred ibis. I was going to say, please don't call me a bin chicken. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's not my fault I'm going through the bins. I I'm, look I'm a little bit dirty sometimes. And, um, and they're the birds out here that are white, they've got a bit of black on the butt and they've got a, a bit of... Um, balding at the back of their head, I guess like some males. <laughs> and they've got long beaks. So you see them out, you'll see them out here. But look, they're, they're part of the totems of the Northern Territory up there. And they're only there because we haven't cared for Mother Earth and the wetlands. So we need to do that. It's important we do take a moment of silence to pay respects to ancestors, pay respects to Mother Earth, um, pay respects to all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander traditionists, elders and custodians of the past and present for looking after country, spirit of country and culture and um, also uh, reflect our journey right here, right now, because it has been a few difficult years with the pandemic we're going through. And remember, we saw a lot of numbers along the way, but they weren't just numbers. Uh, people had their own names, their own dreams, their own ambitions, their own families. So if we just have a moment of silence, a moment of reflection, a moment of playing res respect and centering ourselves. We have three beautiful rivers, which are the boundaries of the Aura Nation. What are they? George's, yes. Nepean and Hawkesbury, Derivan. Um, on behalf of Metropods and Local Aboriginal Land Council, our members and elders, welcome everyone here tonight. It's important we do have intelligence conversations because we see a lot of not intelligent things being done around the world. <laughs> do we? Yes. Um, I think the guys are letting us down around the world when you think about it. A lot of males, um, toxic masculinity and starting wars and other things that we, we really got to work out, you know, what, what we need to do better. So yes, yeah, Aboriginal people, we're defined by, um, through our mothers and through our women, uh, matriarchs. So um, we think it's so important. We just had the um, International Day for Women and we think it's so important to, to respect um, women and to respect people's right, no matter what postcode, the colour of the skin, the gender you identify, um, you should be able to fulfil your dreams and aspirations. So that's a society we really want to create. So um, enjoy tonight. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land, never ceded. I hope you learn a couple of things. And it's important we do take the time out to connect with Mother Earth and also to have a bit of a laugh because that's part of who we are as our human condition. Thanks. Thank you, Uncle Mark, for such a generous welcome and for that pop quiz at the beginning on some of the history around here. I think that ties in really well to the opening chapter of Yanis's book this evening, actually. Um, and I am really delighted um, to be here tonight alongside my colleague, the Australia Institute Senior Fellow and Contributing Editor, Stephen Long. He's also a Walkley Award-winning journalist. Um, and it's our pleasure to be here this evening with Yanis Varoufakis. Um, for those who don't know the Australia Institute, we are celebrating our 30th anniversary in 2024 as Australia's leading think tank. As part of our 30th anniversary celebrations, we are bringing some of the world's leading thinkers to Australia and we're absolutely delighted to be hosting Yanis, who's a visionary economist and um, a professor who lived here in Sydney for a while himself and who's spoken to a number of sold out um, crowds and events um, 
uh, in Adelaide as part of Adelaide Writers Week. Last week in Melbourne, tonight in Sydney, this event is sold out and tomorrow he will speak to a sold out National Press Club. Um, you might have also, as Michael said, caught him on Q&A last night. If you didn't, I highly recommend checking that one out. Um, but yeah, for 30 years, the Australia Institute um, and our independent and non-partisan researchers really played a critical role in shaping Australian public policy uh, for the better. And some of our recent achievements, thanks to some of our research and advocacy, are playing a critical role in the federal government's decision to redesign the stage three tax cuts. I'm not sure if you guys um, are aware of that shifting about $84 billion over the next 10 years to low and middle income earners. Um, thank you. And um, we might hear a little bit about profits tonight. And I did just want to highlight um, the role that our research played at the Australia Institute in really highlighting the fact that excessive corporate profits in the wake of the COVID lockdowns um, we're really responsible for that big burst of inflation that we saw. And it was something that the Reserve Bank um, was trying to ignore. It was something that Treasury was ignoring. And our research really played a role in exposing that. And there's now something like six different inquiries into prices and price gouging. Um, but the reason why we bring out uh, wonderful thinkers like Yanis and do the research that we, we do and hold events like this one is we really think it's important to bring the Australian public into the public policy debate. So I really want to thank you all for being here this evening and for participating in democracy, because that's what you're all doing here tonight. And so while we are known for working across the political aisle to achieve change at the Australia Institute, we're really not shy about taking on powerful vested interests and structural causes of problems. And certainly that is something that Yanis Varoufakis is known for. No stranger to do that. His new book, Techno-Feudalism, What Killed Capitalism, uh, it's available for sale on your way in. And I'm delighted to announce that Yanis will be signing books at the end of this event. So if you haven't grabbed a copy, make sure you do. Uh, and uh, it's really exciting to have him here tonight. It's our absolute pleasure to welcome Yanis Varoufakis here. As you're all no doubt aware, uh, he is the former finance minister of Greece. He's a tireless political leader and campaigner, as well as a best-selling author. I don't know what, what he does in his time off, but uh, he's been pretty busy lately. And we're absolutely privileged to have him in here this evening. Please welcome Yanis Varoufakis. Thank you. I need, of course, to have an, an urgent need also to acknowledge, not ritualistically, the real owners of this land, the Gadical people. And to do so, not simply by paying my respects to elders, past, present, and future, but also to tie up our collective responsibility to indigenous peoples with events which are unfolding today. Because, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, the genocide which is unfolding in Gaza as we speak. <laughs> is intimately linked to Australia. Let me remind you that when the first settlers arrived in this country, invaded this country, they came and conquered on the basis of a particular dictum, a misanthropic dictum called terra nullius. The idea that this land was empty of people, which is, of course, the first move towards genocide. What is the fundamental dictum of the Zionist approach to the land of Palestine? A land without a people for a people without a land. That is the connection. That's why I refuse to condemn Israelis, Palestinians, even the despicable Netanyahu or Hamas. And I blame European white supremacists. Our responsibility as white settlers or descendants of white settlers, as Europeans who hounded the Jews, who did one program, pogrom after the other, and then at some point exported the problem to the land of Palestine out of anti-Semitism, 
our responsibility is to maintain this memory of our crimes against humanity as European white settlers. And this must therefore bring us together in respecting the First Nations, the native populations that we Europeans for centuries hounded and drove into the ground. It is a matter of historical acknowledgement and current political action. Having said that, let's move on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will warm you up briefly before we go to the main course, will be, which will be an interesting conversation amongst the three of us. Three questions as a warm-up. Why did Elon Musk buy Twitter? I won't answer it immediately. <laughs> I'm just leaving this in abeyance. Second question. Why is there a new Cold War between the United States and China, which is dragging Australia in with idiotic decisions like, you know, buying submarines that are utterly useless to this country for $368 billion. Submarines which, by the way, the United States will be able to press a button and switch off when they do not want this country to use them. Third question. Why is there so much concentrated wealth, unprecedented con concentrated wealth, in seven companies in the United States whose capitalization, that is the stock exchange value of those seven companies, you know which ones I mean, big tech, uh, Microsoft, Alphabet, Apple, Nvidia, Google, Alphabet is Google, those seven companies. Do you know that their capitalization is greater than the total capitalization, wait for it, of all companies, not just of some companies, of all listed companies in the following countries? Great Britain. France, Germany, Japan, Canada, and China. That degree of concentration has never, ever been observed in the history of the world, of humanity, of capitalism. These are three questions. And now allow me to set the scene which will introduce a concept that will hopefully throw some light, explanatory light, on these three questions. Imagine that this was the 1770s, 1780s, and we were in England, or maybe Scotland. Why? Because that's where capitalism emerged. With the exception of the town of the city of Amsterdam, that was the um, locus of capitalist emergence. Now, if we were sitting in a pub somewhere in uh, Southampton or London, and we're having a discussion about the state of our society. It is highly unlikely that we would have managed to gather that we were on the cusp of what is called a great transformation from feudalism to capitalism. We would notice that things were changing rapidly. We would notice that there was a shift of power from those who owned the land to those who owned international trade routes, machines, ships, huh? wool, which was a commodity that traded internationally, unlike you know, wheat that didn't at the time. So we would be aware that there was some significant transformation from land to machinery, from the capacity to extract harvests from the peasants, rent, as economists call it, to profit. I believe that we are in a very similar situation today. The people, the good people in England in the 1770s had no concept that there was a great transformation. They just felt that the world no longer made sense in the language that they were used to, in you know, using the concepts that were doing the rounds for 100, 200 years before that. But they wouldn't be able to put their finger on this transformation from feudalism to capitalism. Today, we also have this sensation, I think we all share it, that things are not the way 
they used to be, and particularly, the future is not what it used to be. My hypothesis in this book, which you kindly mentioned, is that we are shifting, we've already shifted, we don't even know that yet, from capitalism to something even worse, which I call techno-feudalism. And my point will be that, you know, I don't know about you, I don't know what your political uh, background and prejudices are. I come from the left. We of the left felt, ever since we understood that we were of the left, that we arrived on this planet in order to overthrow capitalism <laughs> and bring socialism in. If I, what I'm saying is right, then we all have leftists, a serious existentialist crisis. <laughs> we may an, end up, you know, with um, uh, psychoanalysis or psychiatric drugs because capitalism managed to overthrow itself, if I'm right. <laughs> now, how did that happen? We didn't overthrow capitalism. We, the left, are the losers of history. We are pathetic losers. <laughs> that includes me, right? And I think that I have earned that title in 2015 as the failed finance minister of the most bankrupt state in Europe. <laughs> so who overthrew capitalism if we didn't? Capital. Because capital found itself without any competitor. And like a stupid virus that mutates into an even more toxic variant. Remember COVID-19? Huh? It became so toxic that it killed the host in which it lives, the organism in which live, it lives, capitalism. Now, what is this mutant capital? Well, it's what lives in here, which I call cloud capital, because for the first time we have a form of capital which is not produced in order to produce other stuff. Because fishing rods, capital goods, before capitalism, why do we make fishing rods? To catch fish. Why do we manufacture tractors? to produce something else. Why do we even man manufacture all singing, all dancing um, industrial robots to build Teslas and other you know, Volkswagens, right? To produce, they are produced means of production. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is a produced means of behavioral modification. That is the catalyst, at least in my book, of the transformation of this society into what I call a techno-feudal techno order, which um, is a clear and present danger uh, to our macroeconomy, to our states, to our democracy, what democracy we have, which is not a great deal, uh, to geopolitics, and th that, if I'm right, the emergence of this cloud capital, that's what I call this toxic variant of capital, because it lives in the cloud, well, proverbially, not in reality. It, in reality, it's very material. It's made of microchips, of optic fiber cables, of cell towers, of huge server farms. So it's really not on the cloud or in the cloud. It's on land. If I'm right, the rise of this cloud capital explains why Elon Musk purchased Twitter, why we have this m immense concentration of wealth in the hands of the cloudalists, as I call the capitalists who own cloud capital, and why there is a new Cold War between the United States and China. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Um, it's a really fascinating book, and I hope that you've all bought your copy because, yeah, it's wrestling with some really big issues. You've outlined some of them there, but I wanted to take you back to when you first kind of began the book and got the idea for it. Was it that you could kind of sense what was happening and you had a sense and then found that that to be the case? Or did you kind of sense something was amiss and found something different than what you're expecting once you started investigating it? You know, the, the, these ideas come in waves. And, you know, like the conversion of a person like me into a bold person, uh, is dialectical in the sense there's not a single hair that one has to lose before one is bald. So there wasn't a single idea that had to hit me before I came up with this uh, preposterous um, hypothesis that uh, capitalism has uh, uh, evolved or transformed itself into techno-feudalism. But I remember back in 2011, 11, 2012, I had an experience of spending a year 
uh, in a video game company in, uh, just outside of Seattle, where I observed up close and personally a community of 100 million video gamers online around the world who had actually created, created a really functioning economy online which was owned by that particular company that I was working with and for. And when, we, I, when I talk about an economy, uh, don't think this is a, a, a kind of metaphor, an allegory. It is not. I'm talking about, I'll just give you one statistic. 60,000 young men, mostly, some women, between the ages of 15 and 25, who back then in 2011 made between 60,000 and 80,000 dollars a year in Kansas City, in Shenzhen, in Ukraine, in Moscow, in, even in Greece, playing those games and creating what, that was the first time I came across something that resembled a digital fiefdom belonging to one company in which they were serfs in there, slaving away, making a living, but at the same time creating 1.3 billion US dollars revenues for that company. That was a very interesting experience, but I was nowhere near coming to the, to the hypothesis of, of my book. Then, a few years later, uh, as I was um, observing, or actually studying and analyzing, the, what, what, what was go happening to the money that our central banks were printing? Because you will remember after the GFC in 2008, uh, the G7 central banks of the world, uh, they printed something like 35 trillion dollars, American dollars, 35 trillion. To give you an idea, the total GDP, national income of the United States is 21. So they printed 35 trillion and they gave it to the financiers. And I tried to trace the money, you know, follow the money, as I say. And of the money that was actually invested in capital, 90% was invested in big tech. Finally, once I visited the Apple Store, which resembled very much the video game community, because if you think about it, Steve Jobs was, of course, he was a genius, but he created a new form of exploitation. Because on the back of the iPhone, uh, which he sold all over the world and made a mint out of it, but he made an equal amount from the Apple Store, which is what? You capture in the Apple Store vassal capitalists who are producing apps, selling them to people that have iPhones, and the techno feudal lord retains 30% of every sale. That's, you know, that, that was another chink in the capitalist armor. Um, and a few years later, I was, um, I remember I was finishing a book which actually did quite well. It was a tiny little book, A Brief History of Capitalism, which I, the super title was talking to my daughter who happens to be here. I'm just going to embarrass you now. <laughs> She's never forgiven me for having written this book without her permission, by the way. <laughs> well, you deserve that. Um, <laughs> So when I was finishing this, this was my, my little story about capitalism, which, by the way, didn't mention the word capitalism because I tried to write it in a way that was utterly jargon-free. Not even the word capitalism was in there. Um, I felt sad when I finished it, not because I was going to miss it, but because it felt as if I was writing a book about Soviet central planning in 1991. Too late. <laughs> and so by that time, I started getting agitated that I have to look much more carefully into this hunch I had that capitalism had already appended itself. And what do I mean by that? We have to define our terms. What do I mean by capitalism? It's a system which is, has two pylons, two foundations. One is markets. Everything we do under capitalism goes through markets. Labor markets, real estate markets, money markets, you know, markets for commodities, market, futures markets, 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 markets. Whereas under feudalism, only 2% of economic activity went through markets. There was no labor market. People worked, but they didn't get a wage. There was no real estate market. You couldn't buy and sell land, really. I mean, it was disgraceful to sell the land of your father, eh? because it was patriarchal society. Okay. 
Um, and the second is profit. Capitalism is profit dri driven. It is not driven by chivalry. It is not driven by rent. It is not driven by conquest. It is driven by profit. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you enter Amazon.com, you exit capitalism, if I'm right, because Amazon.com, even though there are lots of buyers and sellers, is not a market. It's a digital fiefdom belonging to one man who makes sure that nobody talks to anyone. His algorithm knows you better than you know yourself. And it selects you and matches you with a seller. It knows the seller perfectly well. And the matching probability is such as to maximize the probability or the likelihood that Bezos will extract most rents, 40%, from the capitalist who sells you something while harvesting your data, which then he sells on to Uber, to you know, Facebook, and so on. And that is not capitalism. Welcome to technofeudalism. Thank you. Um, sorry, if I can just talk to the our AV person. Could we get the house lights up here? It just feels like we're a little bit dark down the front. Thank you so much. Sorry, Stephen, I think you're about to ask something. That's okay. Um, Giannis, there's a couple of things that what you just said brings us to, and one is Don Draper. And you write a lot about Don Draper, and having met you, I kind of feel like you're the left-wing Don Draper in many ways. <laughs> you're, you're sort of handsome, charming, charismatic, creative and persuasive. But not drunk on the couch. <laughs> no, that's right. That's right, and there's no one going zooby, zooby, zoo. But, uh, but there, there is a key difference between what we have now in terms of our interaction with persuasion and what Don Draper did with advertising and what, what the madman era represented. I wonder if you could just expand on that for us. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, very good pass. <laughs> uh, okay, Don Draper or any gifted advertiser, what was their job? Their job was to come up with the idea for a poster, for a television advertisement, for a radio advertisement that was a one-way street. It went from them through the medium, you know, the poster, the radio uh, frequencies, into your ears, your eyes, your brain. If it succeeded, you developed a craving for something, whether it's a Mercedes-Benz ben or a Big Mac. But that was the end of it. Don Draper, Sachi and Sachi, and so on, were in the employee of Mercedes-Benz, of uh, McDonald's. And then, if they succeeded, that one-way street signal meant you dashed out, you went to the Mercedes-Benz dealer or to the McDonald's to buy a Big Mac or to get you know, one of these ugly cars. That was it. Today, we have a totally different dialectical, infinite, two-way process. Because Don Draper has been automated. It's a machine. It's, uh, li it lives in here. Take a Siri or a Google Assistant uh, or uh, Alexa, belonging to Amazon. What are these interfaces? They present themselves to you, to you as the, your, your slave. You instructed to do things like, you know, uh, order some milk or switch on the lights or you know, wake me up before I have to wake up. Uh, all those things, right? But in reality, there are interfaces between you and cloud capital, this networked machinery, which lives in satellites and server farms and so on, but it's really material capital, automated machinery, the purpose of which is what? You train it to train you, to train it, to train you, to train you, to train it, to train you, ad infinitum, to do what? To know you so well that it gives you really very good advice. Don't know about you, but when Amazon recommends books to me, I always want to read them, and I do not regret reading them. When Spotify recommends music to me, I like it. Uh, and even if I don't like it, I think that it is interesting. <laughs> right? So we are impressionable human beings. When the machine who learns about us through this two-way process impresses us so spectacularly, then the next time it says, when, when I want a, you know, an electric bike, and I type electric bicycle in Amazon.com, and it recommends one, I'll buy it. But who am I going to buy it from? Unlike Don Draper, who made me go to the dealer of Mercedes-Benz of McDonald's, I buy it directly from the same piece of cloud capital. 
and it bypasses all markets. So that is not capitalism. Well, it, it is, and certainly that is at the heart of the debate, though, to what extent this is a new system, your techno-feudalism, or whether it still is capitalism. And, and, you know, I've had people say to me, well, look, you know, he says these companies have got more capitalization, market capitalization than seven countries. Well, capitalization, they're, they're on the stock market, they're making profits, it's, it's still capital. Um, it was a revelation to me, though, your thesis and reading that. I'd thought about it in a different way. My head is dominated by song lyrics, and I'd thought about the era we're living in as Hotel California, <laughs> because, like, we, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave, because <laughs> we actually need these things. Like, I cannot get around a city now without maps, you know. Um, we're beholden to them for so many things. So you can put them down, but you come back, which made me think with the other lyric from that song, we are all just prisoners here <laughs> of our own device. <laughs> yeah. And so the serfdom thing, really, I got that. Like, we are serfs, you know. We are surfing the net, S-E-R-F, <laughs> the net. So that side of it made sense to me. And yet, in terms of... Um, what they represent, they are massive capitalist enterprises that still want to deliver, and my wife worked for two of them, and I can tell you they want to deliver for Wall Street. They want to have those double-digit increases in, in, you know, in sales and all that stuff. Um, so what, can you just be a bit more specific about how and why we can see this as different from, capi from capitalism, or is, is it some sort of hybrid, really? Is it techno-feudalists that are also capitalists? Well, to begin with, Stephen, uh, I'm not arguing that we've gone back to feudalism. No. Techno-feudalism is built on capital. It is a triumph of capital, but it has killed off capitalism. That is the, you know, the delicious irony in, in my thesis. Uh, now, it's all, in the end, a question of semantics. We could choose to... to, to this, to, to describe the new mode of production as um, cloud capitalism or cloudalism. We can, but in the same way that back in the 1770s, we could have chosen, and it wouldn't have been wrong, instead of talking about capitalism, to talk about industrial feudalism. Huh? Instead of calling the new system capitalism, we could have called it market feudalism. Because it was true, you know, for centuries, even today, wherever you look, there is a degree of feudalism everywhere. Like Especially when it comes to real estate in this country. Right? Employer, employer, employee was called a master and servant relationship. That's right. But it was crucial, I think, that we ditched the word feudalism and we adopted the word capitalism in order to drive home the great transformation that we were experiencing. And I think that this is the same now. The reason why I knew that I would, I would face a backlash, especially by fellow left-wingers who really... One of them said to me, but Yanis, uh, if, if this is not capitalism, why isn't it socialism? Okay, that's your, you know, this is our own trauma. But, you know, <laughs> let's, let's recover from this. Okay, we failed, mate. We failed. It, but remember Rosa Luxemburg in her cell? She asked a question. Socialism or barbarism? Eh, it did not up that it's barbarism. Okay? <laughs> but I call it techno-feudalism. It's that kind of thing. Now, the, the, the important point here is this. You mentioned that you know, Jeff Bezos, and Elon Musk in particular, is looking at the capitalization of Tesla and Twitter and uh, all those things on the stock exchange, and like any other capitalist. They are capitalists. There's no doubt that these people are capitalists. Except that, and I think this is very important, to compare and contrast people like Bezos, Musk, Brin, Zuckerberg, the people who I call either techno-feudal uh, lords or I think it's easier and nicer to call them cloudalists. Compare them with monopoly capitalists of a hundred years ago, like Henry Ford, Westinghouse, Thomas Edison. Now, there are many similarities. Ego-driven, nasty, brutish, monopolistic. They didn't care about anything except the magnification of their own capital. Um, Henry Ford bribed 
municipalities and politicians in order to rip out the tramways, to replace on the streets the trams with his cars and his buses and his coaches. Uh, Thomas Edison, I mean, you, you think that Elon Musk is weird. Thomas Edison had an elephant electrocuted to death in front of children on Coney Island. Why? Because he used the alternative current of Westinghouse, his competitor, to demonstrate that it could electrify, electrocute to death an elephant. Whereas his direct current was harmless. So you know, there are many comparisons. The difference, however, is, and I think this is a very big difference, Henry Ford wanted you to drive his car, the one his production line was churning out. Westinghouse and Edison wanted you, their electricity that was coming out of their powerhouse factory to go into your home. They were selling stuff that they were producing. Their capital goods, the machinery, the production line that Henry Ford famously introduced, were produced by wage labor. Now, compare and contrast these people to Zuckerberg, Bezos, and so on. They don't produce anything for you as cloudalists. Uh, Musk does when it comes to Tesla, but not Twitter. Huh? So, uh, what does Bezos produce? Nothing. He has created, using capital, a digital fiefdom in which he encases us in order to create, to, to create circumstances that allow him to extract a ground rent from every seller on it. Uh, well, I call it cloud rent to dis distinguish it from, from uh, um, feudalism. And then, of course, the great innovation, which has nothing to do with capitalism, which has nothing to do with feudalism. And thus, I think it warrants a new term. The great innovation is that we are all serfs, even if we don't buy anything. As you are walking around the CBD today, with your phone, Google Maps knows where you are. You don't even need to do anything to it. And that informs Google Maps as to where the traffic is heaviest. And it, therefore, it reinforces and makes more valuable the cloud capital of Google. Kids uploading videos, photographs. We, older people, tweeting. We're adding to the cloud capital of those capital capitalists. That has never happened before. This is unwaged labor. We may contribute it voluntarily, but after all, the worst slavery is one that has been contributed voluntarily. And one final number. Take any capitalist corporation, which is in the stock market, its owner, like Henry Ford, whoever, you know, Krupp in Germany, uh, they really want to see the stock price going up. Now, all these old-fashioned capitalist conglomerates, like General, Ele General Electric or Lockheed, 85 to 90% of their revenue goes into salaries and wages. Do you know what the equivalent is for Facebook? 0 0.8. Why? Because you are the labor. You are producing their cloud capital, and you are not getting paid. And that is not an ethical point. It is a substantive macroeconomic point because when all this value comes out of the circular flow of income, there isn't enough money for people to demand the goods and services that you know, the capitalist sector will produce within this techno feudalist system. So that's why we have bullshit jobs. This is a scientific term, bullshit <laughs> jobs. I didn't invent it, David Graeber did. <laughs> Okay, it's a very accurate description of the kind of jobs that youngsters are facing, right? the precariat. Uh, and then you have the Reserve Bank of Australia needing to continue to pump up the economy because you have low demand as a result of the cloud rents extracted by the cloud list. That is new. And I think we need a new term, and I proposed it. That's such a good point, but I kind of want to take things up a bit of a, a level there and talk to you uh, or ask you about your observations on the real power of these companies and these collateralists because they're not only changing our behaviours, as you've talked about, but, it, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, 
the rubber barons of old. We used antitrust laws in the United States to kind of break them up. These companies seem so powerful and resourceful that they're kind of more powerful than almost nation states, it seems. So I want to ask you next about how your solutions in the book for how we can start addressing this kind of power and taking it back. How, how are we going to get ourselves out of this? Well, every theory of change must have an end game that is a final long-term proposal or solution, but also explain how we get there from where we are. And that's not easy. It's a bit like the Irish joke. I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> but w this is where we are. We have to start from here. So let's talk about the end game. The only way of creating a sustainable, technologically advanced society which uses algorithms, because we will, we d I personally am addicted to them, and I make no excuse for that. I think that artificial intelligence, uh, algorithms, uh, reinforcement mechanisms within these algorithms are fantastic. I mean, I actually think that they are a testament to the ingenuity of the human spirit. The fact that these are, as we speak, there are algorithms that are designing antibiotics that can neutralize bacteria that kill people in hospitals, antibiotics that no human brain has the capacity or the speed to design. That is something we should celebrate. So, the, But how can we, can we envisage a society where we use algorithms without becoming used by the algorithms, where we are the masters, not they? Well, for that, and this is where my old left-wing proclivities uh, will re-emerge in full uh, technicolor. Or I techno color. <laughs> or techno color. <laughs> Thank you. He's good, isn't he? <laughs> um, is in s saying that, look, the old social democratic ways, the old New Deal ways, the old regulatory systems are bunk. You cannot do to big tech, to cloud capital, what the uh, Theodore Roosevelt did in you know, the 1910s and 1920s to Standard Oil and Rockefeller. You cannot break them up. I mean, you can break up an oil company that is a monopoly across the United States, and you can you know, just convert them into many different c companies, one for each state, like you know, happened with Standard Oil. But how do you break down Google? I mean, it's a search engine around the world, and the beauty of it is that it is global. Huh? But, on, but on that, Yanis, one of the things that's actually really annoyed me is the failure of regulators, because Google had a search engine, and Go Google has actually been crap at developing any useful products beyond the search engine. It built one fantastic mousetrap, but it bought nearly everything else, and the regulators let it do it, and everything it bought, it bought an Australian company that did maps. It bought uh, advertising platforms that programmatically allocate advertising. It bought phones and phone tech and lots and lots of things. And each time it bought something new, it got more, more information to feed into the algorithm to make that search engine all-powerful, all-knowing, completely dominant and unassailable. And the regulators were so stupid they let it happen because they thought all these things were different markets. And so I think that that was a, a fundamental failure. I don't know if you can undo it by doing it, but the, the, but what, you know, to bring out my left-wing proclivities as well, if we come back to square one on all this, and it's a point you've made, the, the internet was developed by, you know, by the state and, and it was open. It was open source, uh, you know, and a, a lot of the tech was, and we allowed it to be privatized. So can that we... That was a key moment. Yeah, yeah. The key moment was to allow Google to emerge, not to allow it so much to, to be predatory. It, would, it was always going to end up being predatory. You know, you have to kill them when they are small. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. So, yeah, we should have killed it as a baby and then it became a monster, you know. Well, not allow it to grow by not allowing the privatization of the internet. It's a bit like yeah. electricity markets. We should never have had electricity markets. It's pathetic to have electricity markets. There's only one, one wire coming out of the wall in your home. There can be no market. It is not a market. It is a fiction created by government on behalf of oligarchs. So my question is, can we dare to dream, 
Yes. <laughs> Can we dare to dream of a future where we, where we bring back and collectivise the World Wide Web and, the t and, and everything that's come from it. We have, a duty, we have a duty to dream of the moment when we socialise the means of production, distribution yeah. and communication. Yeah, well said. So that's our task. We've got to be, we've got to be the revolutionaries fighting to change this. But yeah. Stephen, uh, you, you reminded me, and we were having this, this discussion in the green room, but I'll share it with you. Um, he reminded me earlier of um, one of the happiest moments of my life. Uh, it was in the Google campus, in their auditorium, you know, in the belly of the beast. <laughs> right? They had invited me, goodness knows why, <laughs> to talk to them about digital money. Well, we know why, because they care about money, they like a digital, they thought, okay, here is a crazy Greek economist who will talk to us about digital money. But I started off by th um, thanking them on behalf of humanity for having developed uh, a brilliant search engine. But then I gave them but the bad news. The bad news is that you n it is so good that you have created a human right. Because denying people access to your search engine uh, is to violate human rights now. And therefore, once you have developed and produced a human right, now you have to give it up and it has to be nationalized. <laughs> or internationalized to be precise. And he left and they said, should we hire him? And I said, no, he's not googly enough. <laughs> um, but I think that's a really important uh, point. And, but um, allow me to answer your question because yeah. I haven't answered the question. What are the, okay, so what do I mean by this? Very briefly, imagine a world, and this, this was my previous book, which, which was a science fiction novel, political science fiction novel, in which I tried to answer this question. How could the world be working, to operating to, to today um, as a technologically advanced, properly democratic society. So I won't bother you with that. But what I'm going to say is this. Imagine, just for a moment, allow yourself to dream that we do two things. The first thing, actually three things. The first thing is we change corporate law and we democratize corporations very simply by saying that we introduce the principle of one employee, one share, one vote. Shares become li like library cards in universities. You can't buy them, you can't sell them. When you enroll, you get it. You use it as long as you're a student. You can uh, utilize it in order to connect to the internet, to uh, borrow books, and to vote in student selections. Uh, and then you have to give it back. Uh, immediately, the corporations would become cooperatives. Stock exchanges would stop, it would simply cease. Because if you, if you can't buy and, se and, and sell shares, shares are simply given on a one vote, one person basis, there is no stock of change. Second change, imagine if the Reserve Bank of, Bank of Australia in this country, the Fed in the United States, the ECB in Europe, were to give each one of us a digital wallet with a PIN number, which can happen tomorrow, by the way. They have the technology, they can do it tomorrow morning. Uh, you can put your money in there, you can transfer it, 100% safety because it's on the ledger of the central bank. That would immediately, immediately upend the private banks. Because then the bankers, I, I am not, I'm a libertarian, I don't believe in banning anything. But they would have no reason to exist. They would have to come and convince you that you need to open a bank account with them. They'll have to offer you something. At the moment, if you want to buy coffee at Starbucks or wherever, hmm? hope it's not Starbucks, <laughs> horrible coffee. Um, in the, your local cafe, right? You have to have a bank account with, with a private bank. Why? Why do the private bankers have a monopoly on our payment system? This should be like a public road without tolls, right? <laughs> and it can be provided by the central bank. So the second thing is this. Thir thirdly, imagine you have a digital bill of rights. So you own your own digital identity and your data. And anybody who wants to use it sh should bargain with you and pay you. Now those three things suddenly create a techno-democracy as opposed to techno-feudalism. But how do we get there? Huh? Well, you need a revolution otherwise, because I'm sure that these people will actually nuke a population that demand that. They will actually nuke their own people. Having they are ruthless. Having worked with Ebony, I think she can get us there. <laughs> <laughs> but very briefly, imagine as a first step, very, very modest first steps. First one, 
a cloud tax. A cloud tax. Every transaction on Amazon or such, uh, every penny you put into Facebook in order to promote your product or your political party for that matter, it gets taxed 5%. Ah, modest, 5% on revenues, not profits, because they never have profits. They have the best accountants in the world. They will always drum up their costs to be equal to their revenue so that they have no profits and they don't get taxed. You know, um, Amazon pays no tax. Zero. Z zero is a radical number. You multiply it with anything, it becomes zero. <laughs> okay. uh, th that's the first step. The second step, imagine if we go together, Australia, Europe, and we were to say to these uh, cloud lists, if you want to operate in our social economies, you have to deposit 10% of your shares in a social equity fund where dividends accumulate and then they fund a basic income. And then that 20% can become 30% and 50%. And in the limit, you have liberal communism. That might be a good jumping off point to my final question. Uh, and we've only got um, a little while left, but I did kind of want to finish on democracy and what this is doing to democracy. Um, the Australia Institute's really deeply interested in strengthening Australia's democracy. It's under assault from all kinds of things, but this is kind of a major global phenomenon that you have observed. What do you think is going to happen or what is happening to democracy because of techno-feudalism, like we've talked about the economic impacts of it, but you also touch on the behavioural aspects of it and its impact on democracy as well. What do you want this audience to leave with knowing about the future of democracy as it interacts with techno-feudalism? Well, we know that cloud capital is designed to poison the conversation. That's how it accumulates. It accumulates by stirring up anger, terror, not in the sense of terrorism, but terrifying the people that you are conversing with. Uh, we see this in, uh, in around universities, and I speak about universities because it's a realm I understand. You have this ridiculous contradiction. Students who are so easily triggered and that want safe spaces and not want, do, do not want to be confronted by uncomfortable ideas, okay? So everything becomes a blamange, everything becomes j just a magma of inanities that everybody's not angry with. And then they go into their phones and the terrorism begins. The gloves are off, they hate one another, they, the way that they tweet, if anybody spoke to them in that way, they would have called the police, right? So cloud capital has destroyed the quality of the conversation between real human beings and has poisoned the conversation on the cloud. But allow me to say that I think that the Australian Institute is doing more important work than that. You are not reinforcing democracy and you're not helping democracy get better. Folks, there is no democracy. We live we live in oligarchies with periodic elections whose purpose is to legitimize the fact that we don't have democracy. Yes. And what of the Australian... <laughs> and what the Australian Institute is doing, it is creating a space so that people can get informed about the degree of this power imbalance which is making democracy under the present circumstances impossible in order to give people the possibility of dreaming of putting the demos back into the democracy. Thank you very much. We're going to have to finish it up there. Thank uh, Yanis Varoufakis, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get time to answer the questions ab about why Elon, Elon Musk bought Twitter <laughs> and why we're in a new Cold War between the US and China, but to, you'll find the answers in the book when you buy it. And um, 
If I can ask uh, for one more round of applause for Yanis, because he is going to go and sign books shortly. Thank you so much, Yanis. Do you want to head up on the book? Um, if you can... I, I did just want to ask you all to remain seated so that he could actually make it to the book stand um, to begin to sign some books. Um, but just a, a little bit more housekeeping before we finish. I just want to thank you all so much for coming out this evening and uh, being part of this conversation. A round of applause for my colleague Stephen as well, please. Um, so you can grab a copy of Techno Feudalism from Glee Books up the top and Yanis will sign up for you for the next half an hour. Uh, and I did want to remind you, you can check out uh, Yanis on Q&A last night if you missed that. And he is going to be at the National Press Club in Canberra tomorrow. That will also be live streamed on ABC. So you can check it out on their live stream there. Um, and as part of the Australia Institute's 30th anniversary celebrations, we are hosting another great thinker, the former president of Kiribati and chair of the Pacific Elders Voice, Anote Tong. You can find some of his events, including the one that we're doing in, sit in North Sydney this Friday on our website. Um, and if I may, the Australia Institute is not funded by political parties or corporations. We are funded by donations from good people like yourselves right across Australia. Uh, and so please, if you can, think about heading on over to australiainstitute.org.au to kick in uh, a donation to help fund our research or indeed to become a monthly donor to the Australia Institute. We couldn't do what we do without the support of people like you uh, and uh, you should be able to find some more information about us if you've never heard about us before in that lovely pamphlet that you got on your way in and there's a QR code that will take you to our website there as well. Thank you so much for joining us here this evening uh, and please join me again in thanking Yanis Varoufakis. Thanks very much everyone.